So this is probably going to be a long one. That's it. That's my intro. Hi, I'm Amanda. You're watching Small Entertainment. And today we are talking about the Las Vegas Grand Prix from my Las Vegas hotel room at the Flamingo. First off, why did it go I go? Um, well, I genuinely love F1. I wanted to go to a Grand Prix and this was logistically the closest one to me being based in Los Angeles. Just kind of made sense. And then also, you know, first Las Vegas Grand Prix uh, since 1982, I want to say is the year. Uh, they did that at Caesars Palace, which is actually, I'm looking at it right now. Why did F1 come to Las Vegas? Mainly Daniel Ricardo. I'm kidding, partially, sort of, a little bit. The main reason that I heard they wanted to do a Las Vegas Grand Prix was because they wanted to further the fandom, the growing fandom, if you will, of US fans for Formula One. Basically, uh, Drive to Survive on Netflix has led to a lot more American fans in F1. Not that it's the only thing, okay? But it's, you know, it's a catalyst, if you will. And so they thought that adding another US race would be a good idea. They currently have Austin. They have the Miami Grand Prix, which is earlier in the calendar. And now they have the Las Vegas Grand Prix, which there is, I've been told, a 10-year contract in place with a three-year opt-out. I believe the opt-out is a kind of a one-way thing where the city of Las Vegas, Las Vegas F1, that type of thing can say, hey, we don't want to do this anymore. I believe it's that, which we'll talk about in a second. As far as like why Vegas might want to have it here. It's the same reason that Vegas wants any sporting event to come here. They want this to be a destination more than just a way station. They want you to come here for things aside from just passing through on your way to LA or coming here just to gamble for your 21st birthday and drink and all this stuff. They want you to come for other things so that you then go and gamble and drink and, you know, fill up the hotels and things like that. So um, it's a smart move, frankly. Uh, we just saw this. They did this with uh, TwitchCon as well, um, which I, TwitchCon's not coming back to Vegas, but that's a whole other video that I've already done. There's a lot to love about Vegas, and I'm not going to be one of those people that's going to sit here and complain about Vegas as a whole because that's just not who I am. I have debated moving here several times, and I'm sure one day I probably will end up moving here. I have a bunch of friends that live out here, so if you're expecting me to sit here and just like rip into Vegas as a city, I'm just not going to do that. But a lot of people have complained about Vegas uh, since it was announced. I also talked about not necessarily, you know, the problem with Vegas, you know, as a Grand Prix location in my video, at least I hope that's not how it came across. I was concerned with the construction that I was seeing and the speed at which they were doing it and the starting too late in the calendar, in my opinion, for building everything. And that's pretty much what my last video about the construction for the Grand Prix was. The complaints that have been around Vegas for the Grand Prix for the most part have been, I don't know, I've seen the response go back and forth. I've always thought that the criticism was, why is there a third race in the US? I completely disagree with the rhetoric that there needs to be another one. Stop. As an American, I am telling you, stop it. Especially because these are some of the more expensive ones in the calendar. <laughs> also, the that Vegas was just going to be a big spectacle and not about the sport, the driving itself, the racing itself. And so announcing the opening ceremony and the amount of fans that were going to be there, the musical lineup, all of that, uh, it was criticized pretty heavily immediately, which is always so funny to me because then people, it's like, well, the people that matter aren't the ones complaining. It's like, well, you got the drivers and you got your established fan base you got them complaining so who 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 matters to you i'm just curious investors i get it it's a business at the end of the day this sport is a business and so a lot of this i can just be like oh money you know so much of it can come down to that but you know you guys don't make money if no one's attending if no one's you know buying the merch if no one's you know tuning in to watch the gps so let's explain how i was able to go i love f1 and my dad loves vegas he loves vegas so much he is on a first name basis with his slot host for the casinos okay um he comes here a lot I spent um a undisclosed to me amount but it's enough that his slot host gave us this hotel room five nights comped and we overlook the track we got our tickets for thursday and friday night also through the slot host as well originally we just got tickets to thursday and my dad didn't understand why i was frustrated <laughs> by that i was like okay well i'm gonna go and buy a ticket for saturday then and he was like what you we, we're gonna see like time trials i was like no we're gonna see practice thank you but also 
I'm going to buy myself a ticket to the race. So the slot host was funny because she was like all excited to call and tell us, which was very sweet to have this comp. It was very nice. I'm not complaining about the comp tickets whatsoever. I want to make that abundantly clear. She was like, why does everyone want to go Saturday? Why is everyone asking for Saturday tickets? I was like, because that's when the race is. And that's so funny to me because this is something that I saw with Miami as well. This is not in relation to the slot host in general, but like there's so many because uh, the slot host thing that was done meticulously. That was like, unless you have lost over $200,000 to a casino, you were not getting a Saturday ticket. And I had that specifically told to me by another slot host when I went in and I was like, do you guys just have any tickets? I will buy them off of you. And they said, no. But my point is, is that there's a lot of companies uh, like uh, brand deals and things like that, brand trips that try and capitalize on the growing fandom in the US for uh, F1 and the trendiness of it, if you will, and don't do the bare minimum research. And then you have content creators that they're inviting to events, but they're only giving them Thursday tickets or they're having them fly out on Sunday, the day of the race and all this stuff. And it's like, of course, people are mad at you. I ended up just buying myself a last minute ticket to the similar grandstand where I was before in PG2. And for me, with the fees and all of that through Ticketmaster, I, it was $1,600 for the race. Luckily, I can afford that. Luckily, I make good money on YouTube. Luckily, I love F1 and I wasn't gonna miss this whether I was making a video or not. I wasn't gonna miss that, but that is ridiculous. Now that is a last minute ticket, but even the cheaper tickets were not for the race night. The thing about the opening ceremony that I think was done really poorly on the part of F1 Las Vegas was that they did not make it clear enough who got access to the opening ceremonies and who did not. And I did talk to a few people who said, Oh yeah, I went because when I got my ticket, I saw that it said that I had access to the opening ceremony based on which grandstands you were in. Okay, it was specific spots you had access to, uh, to the opening ceremony. But I don't think they publicized that enough because I didn't even see that until like probably a day or two before the event. Now, I don't think my ticket would have gotten me in because the end of the hairpin is where we were, PG2. And so I don't think that would have gotten us in, but I'm not certain. What ended up happening and how I was able to attend the Wednesday night opening ceremony in the Paddock Club with my dad as my plus one was I met Tony, F1 Tony, okay, from TikTok at the Netflix Cup. We passed by each other and I was like, oh yeah, I've seen you on TikTok, all this stuff. We talked for a little bit. About 5 p.m. she messaged me and she was like, you're on TikTok, right? And with the Aston Martin team and TikTok and they want to know if you and a plus one like want to come tonight. Yes. So they messaged me, we get talking and I basically had about 30-ish minutes, if that, to get from my hotel to the proper gate to go and meet Kate from Aston Martin uh, with my dad so that we could go and get our little paddock passes and go on into the paddock club with Aston Martin. So shout out Tony, go check her out on YouTube, go check her out on TikTok, go check her out on everything, okay, for being a real one. So I did a little review of the paddock club over on TikTok and uh, basically that's where we were for the opening ceremonies. Uh, they fed us, there was good food in there. Basically I was right behind 30 seconds to Mars. Honestly, while I was there, as far as an opening ceremony goes, I think this was the best case scenario for Vegas because I fully was expecting a cheese fest, a mess, these guys to be like, I'm going to kill whoever decided. Like, I thought they were going to jump Daniel by the end of it. I fully thought that that's what we were walking into. And instead, I think that this was a fairly tight, fairly successful opening ceremony. Pretty much everyone did one song. They never went over three minutes and they just kept it moving. The way they used those like electric screen motorhomes were pretty solid. I think they utilized them pretty well. And then to have the teams go and just do a little, yes, Hunger Games-esque, come up, come down, all this stuff. Yes, it's goofy, okay? But I think it's better than having the guys walk down the center aisle while these musical artists are performing and they're being announced one by one with their faces on the screens behind them as they're walking down or what have you. So Kate had been like, hey, if you hang out for a little bit, like I would love to be able to bring you down to the garage and show you the Aston Martin garage. Love it. Went down there, did a whole review of that as well, all on TikTok, okay? Because this was a partnership with TikTok. So uh, I made sure to focus on TikTok content for this because they were the ones that made it so that I was able to get this ticket. I don't believe I ever actually met anyone from TikTok while I was there though. I think I was just the Aston Martin team that I met while I was there. Um, but thank you to Aston Martin and TikTok for having me and uh, letting me be goofy as hell. First Formula One Grand Prix, and this is also the first Las Vegas Grand Prix in literal decades, okay? Just gotta come check this out. This has been insane. The Aston Martin garage has been great. Our Aston Martin team has been so awesome. So thank you so much for having me. So my dad had no idea that um, free practice two was supposed to start at about 12, 12.30 a.m. Once free practice one 
abruptly ended. Um, he was like, I'm going to go. I said, I don't blame you. It's fine. I'm going to stay. I'm not going to leave. Basically, we get there. We get food. The food situation, it's funny because I've been seeing people post about the food situation on TikTok and things like that. The food was free. It was part of your ticket. So it was included in your ticket, essentially, which I do think was a smart move because I fully went in there expecting to spend a small fortune on food for the Grand Prix. And so to have that at least comped was nice. Also comped was liquid death and non-alcoholic drink. I was in the Red Bull fan zone, essentially, is where our seats were. And that's not what we picked, which some people were like, oh, you guys got the worst seats, whatever. I liked where we were. We were at the end of turn one. I saw the drama during the actual Grand Prix that was like right at that corner. So I was happy with where I was, but I get it. I wanted to see more racing as well, but that was never going to be a possibility for the most part with where the grandstands were set up for pretty much most of the track. I think the only people who saw a good amount of actual racing would be the people on the strip and then the various people that were actually in like random pop-ups for different casinos and then the people that climbed up on roofs and, and uh, parking garages and things like that. You guys got good views. But we were basically in the Red Bull fan zone and my main complaint with this area is that you guys had no outdoor heaters none. I made friends with some employees and they were like, yeah, we think that this was planned very last minute because the Heineken area, the other side, the East Harmon zone, the through the tunnels and all of that, which we'll talk about in a second as well. Um, they had space heaters. They had heat, you know? So it was like freezing where we were and it was like really dim. There wasn't a lot of light. Originally, we didn't really know where else we could go. So we ended up just going back to our seats and hanging around and waiting for free practice one to start. Um, we were in row three, so really far down. And uh, then free practice started. And then the pot host whole situation started. Now, Kim Ullman does get credit for predicting this. Pre the Las Vegas Grand Prix as well, he talked about how the manhole covers are usually welded down for street circuits and that he wasn't sure if they were going to be doing that and if that was going to be a problem. Sure enough, it ended up being a problem. We watched as the Ferrari of Carlos Sainz pulled to a stop just at the top of the Las Vegas Strip straightaway. There you see the car being taken behind the wall. And at the top of the screens, you can see that the stewards have declared the practice session will not be resumed. I had a feeling that this was going to be a problem already for the us night of that this was an indicator that this was going to be kind of the nature of things for the night was the FIA said that uh, it was a loose manhole cover. It was like a water drain cover basically for like an access point that the concrete read around it had failed and that they had determined that that issue did exist and was a potential issue of existing as well throughout other places in the track for the strip, I believe specifically, um, and that they needed to remedy those. But then when F1 Las Vegas made a statement, they said that one manhole cover had been discovered as being the problem and that it is being fixed and they're working on fixing this one problem. On one hand, again, business. You don't want to acknowledge that the problem is bigger than it actually is, but I never think it's a good idea when the company entity and the essential like governing body entity, the official entity of something are giving out conflicting statements. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's a good sign of things to come. Finally, they said like, oh yeah, 2 a.m. We're gonna have free practice to start up again. And it's like, okay, great. And it's it's funny because as I was walking around between East Harmon Zone, the Red Bull Fan Zone and the other East Harmon Zone, the Heineken Zone, um, I saw one of the manhole covers on the ground with like what looked like a dollop of concrete on top of it. And I was like, no wonder a Formula One car sucked this thing up <laughs> and just like, they finally put on the announcement that the free practice due would commence at 2 a.m. So it's already like around midnight around this point, 1230-ish, at about 128, 129 a.m., an announcement comes on letting us know that they will be closing all the fan zones at 1.30 a.m. Have a nice night. See you later. And it's like, what does that mean? We've made the determination that we will be closing all Las Vegas Grand Prix fan areas at 1.30 a.m. Pacific time. We look forward to welcoming fans back later today. Is that for not exciting right now? Free practice three and qualifying Isn't it sessions. 1.30 right now? For a second, what we initially thought it was, because even the marshals in front of me were like, wait, what does that mean? Was that it just meant that we had to stay in our seats, that the fan zones like the other side, of, like outside of the grandstands and all of that, that those were closing. And so it's like, okay, you're not gonna be able to get food or alcohol, but you can stay in your seat. And so I was like, I'm just gonna stay in my seat. So we just got a message uh, saying that they will be closing the Las Vegas fan areas at 1.30 a.m. It is currently 1.30 a.m. I am sitting here. I'm not getting up because they are doing FP2 at 2 a.m. 
So it's a little bit of a vague message. I'm not getting up. I felt really bad because there was this girl and her mother and the daughter was probably 13, 14. So excited to watch it. Her mom was like, yeah, I'm here with her tonight. Her dad's here with her tomorrow. She loves it. And she was just like dozing off, trying so hard to stay awake to watch the free practice. And then suddenly, get out. <laughs> so basically what's happening now is uh, the employees uh, that are working the fan zones and guest services and all of that were only scheduled to a certain time. So they can't let them go until all of us are gone. So we can stay technically, but then they have to stay. I got a dip because I don't think that's fair to the employees to make them stay just so I can watch free practice too. I don't like the statement that they made. I'm glad they made a statement. And I hate that there's been a lot of like speculation about like, again, I've talked about how this is a business and all this stuff. It's like, oh, well, you can't say sorry. You can't give apologies because then that's an admittance of guilt. Yes. It is. They've asked us all to leave. As you can see, everyone's clearing up behind me. And honestly, I can't blame them because the employees can't leave until we leave. And obviously this is all delayed. I don't think there was another option here for the employees because they're only paid to a certain time. They're only scheduled to a certain time and they have to come back tomorrow. The only thing that makes sense for why they kept us till they did and waited that long to give us the notice because you know when your employees are scheduled to. You know when it's time to leave. You can't tell me that someone didn't come and tell you, hey, we only have the employees until this time. I get it. You're trying to get things saying, we're just going to do it till this. We're going to do it till that. Like, and if there is that type of communication issue where like you were learning that the half of your workforce, if not 90% of your workforce for your fan zones have to clock out at a certain time where you have to pay them overtime, which you were never going to do. Frankly, let's be realistic here. It's either a complete and utter breakdown of communication or you knew and decided to wait until the last minute. The breakdown of communication is an issue within your company. You need to fix that entirely. That's on you and people have a right to be pissed. If you're running your business like a lemonade, don't know lemonade stands are run better than that. I can't even say that that's a lemonade stand because the two people standing there working it together can talk to each other. Whoever's making lemonade inside is probably coming out and being like, oh my God, you guys, we're out of lemons. <gasps> we're out of cups. Oh no, we have to go get more cups. You know, there's probably more communication on the lemonade stand set up by toddlers. If it's that, which I don't believe, I still think that the reason they kept it as long as they did is because they wanted alcohol sales. That's my personal opinion. I think that's what it was. I think they wanted to keep people there as long as possible so they could try and make up some money. And I think people are allowed to be upset when you give us till the last minute. Forget it being unfair to fans and the fans that paid money. I'm not even talking about myself in that regards. I'm just someone that's stuck around essentially. It's not fair to your employees because then they have to deal with the brunt of your poor planning and they have to deal with the brunt of the backlash and the anger. And that is not fair to the employees who are just there to do their job. So it's also not fair on the part of the fans to snap at employees and go up to, you know, the people just trying to help and, you know, be like, okay, well, where's my refund? Things like that. That's not fair to the employees as well. So you guys bungled this. You bungled Thursday night. You did. The end. Two things can be true at the same time. You can be a fan of F1 and love the sport and still be frustrated with how the Vegas Grand Prix has been handled or how it was conducted or the circuit looking like spider pig on the ceiling. You, you can have those opinions. That's allowed. You're allowed to complain about things. It's okay. Day two, we had FP2. No one, you know, lost the undercarriage of their car. It's funny because I was like sitting there and I was tired and I was obviously cold. My dad came closer to about eight, uh, like right before, you know, FP2 started. And um, he kept being like, are you having fun? Are you, are you good? Like what's wrong, whatever. And I was like, why is he asking me that? Like, I, I don't get it. And then I realized what it was was that for my dad, this was just like a fun, cool event. That's what this was for him. He just got to go to an event and see cars going fast and be super close to the cars. For me, it's like I am rooting for these, uh, you know, fast boys and they are giving me anxiety and I'm stressed out by the safety of this track and I'm stressed out by, you know, <laughs> the cold, but I want them to do well and now I'm panicking. And so he just saw me going into like the focus, <laughs> the fan focus mode of being anxious and uh, he's not used to seeing me like that because I don't care about most sports. <laughs> but then I was telling him like oh, the other day, I was telling him today, I was like, yeah, I just realized it's like, yeah, I, I've never told you like when you're watching a Houston Astro games, like, are you having fun? I'm kidding. He doesn't actually like the Houston Astros. He actually hates it. That was a little shout out for him because I know it's like, he'll, he'll text me about that later when he watches this. He'll be like, you said I like the Houston Astros. He hates them. But when he's watching a baseball game or whatever, you know, I'm not sitting there being like, are you having fun? You know, because of course not because he's watching the game, you know, so it's the same thing. Bumped into the employees that I met the night before again. And I really want to make this abundant 
wanted Leclerc as well because before going in to Friday, they had made it very clear that if there was any scheduling issues, if things did have to change, that they had staggered the employees to come in at certain times so that there would be no risk of like, okay, everyone has to clock out at this point type of thing, okay? Um, so that was good, but I went and talked with the um, girls that I'd met the night before and they were like, yeah, no, you gotta know, like there things are so much better tonight. Like the communication is better. They have us over here. They had put their booth. Uh, they were part of like the Heineken zone, uh, like one of the Heineken booths. They had like been in a really bad spot before they put us, they put them in a better spot. We're like, we're in a such better spot. People keep bringing us food. I had been bringing them food the night before because I knew all the food was going to go bad because they can't just keep the food overnight. They have to, it's like made fresh. It's hot. It's, they're making it back there. And so they were like, can you go grab us food? Because it was free for me. So I just went and kept bringing them food. And so they were like, everyone keeps bringing us food. It's really nice. I want to make that abundantly clear that like the employees that I met the night before had been really adamant about how much better things were run for night two which is important to note because it's always important to note when yes night one was a mess and we can still acknowledge that things were a mess but an effort was made to try and correct the mess and besides if for someone like me i trust the employees more than i trust the organizers at that point and the employees are telling me that things are being run better that's what i'm gonna listen to qualifying happens and then uh mclaren is out in Q1, but then Williams gets to Q3. It was crazy in the crowds that night. It definitely thinned out a lot for qualifying, which I figured was the case. It's just a late night, which is the thing that I think people were like, oh yeah, no one's there. Like they didn't sell a lot of tickets. They did sell a good amount of tickets. The reality is, is that these were late nights and like they were late nights for anybody. Any of us who like stayed up for, tried to get to FP2, we were all exhausted. I'm shocked I made it as late as I did for qualifying. Same with like last night for the actual race. We'll talk about it in a second. I fell asleep during the race at one point. I was exhausted you know i get it vegas city never sleeps but like you know people have lives we're not always used to being nocturnal okay not everyone's 20 and i say that as someone who's 26 but it was a cool crowd experience to see you know everyone's excitement over logan you know qualifying where he did that was great i was still very worried about that hairpin turn. I was worried about that because I just kept seeing specifically the Alpha Tauris uh, overcorrecting and I believe the Haas guys as well. Um, there was a lot of overcorrecting in that turn, like jerking really quickly and that stressed me out. So I was worried. Day of the race, about 5 p.m. I just went and, and bought my ticket. It was in the same grandstand that I was before because I was I was basically attached to this zone but I had made friends with the flag marshals and I wanted to keep my buddies with me. So I figured it was a good spot to stay in. And again, I thought something bad was gonna happen at turn one. Frankly less bad happened at turn one than I thought it did because I fully thought that we were going to lose at least three cars in that first turn, frankly, right at the start. That's what I was expecting. The Cirque du Soleil show that they did before the race itself was interesting to say the least. I don't know. I just, and I like Vegas. I like these shows, you know, but I'm also like, do we need it now? Because what am I here for? I'm here for a race. I'm not here for Vegas. I think the organizers were kind of like, okay, they're here for Vegas. We want them here for Vegas. F1 is how we're going to get them here for Vegas. And I think that that was a mistake. I think that there was a bit of a jumbling of what this could have been and what it was. I'm not shocked that they had a red carpet, but I do think it was silly. Celebrities can be fans of F1 too, okay? We're not, that's not the point of this. But making such a big deal about them being a fans of it is it because you want their fans to also like F1 or because you want their fans to just come to the Vegas Grand Prix in the hopes that they're going to meet Paris Hilton? I should have used a different example aside from Paris Hilton because Paris Hilton was literally there with Hilton and Hilton sponsors McLaren. So obviously they wanted one of the Hiltons there. So that was a bad example, but you get my point. Is it supposed to add to the glitz and glamour? I guess yes, because like, oh, look at these fabulous celebrities that love F1. But then so many of these celebrities don't love F1. They just like, the opportunity to get a good photo, you know, which is the case with most of the current rhetoric for celebrity and influencers and all of that. And I, hey, I got photos in the pit lane. I did that fully, fully admit it. I did that. That was fun for me. It's like kind of like adding the layers to this sandwich of this is a spectacle, not a sport type of thing. That's, that's the, the sport got like a few layers and then spectacle Scooby-Doo would not be able to fit the sandwich in his mouth. That's what we're looking at over here for like another one on the pile maybe some bacon some cheese you know some and maybe oh let's get spicy let's throw some brioche on there you know let's get spicy with it that's, the, that's such a weird comparison i'm tired and then it was time for the grand prix so i ended up grabbing a amex american express radio here you go um i don't remember when i grabbed this these were tuned to i believe this guy sports broadcast so during the grand prix i had these things in the entire time mainly because during qualifying, I was getting frustrated 
with the announcers because they just kept drilling home the point that oh my god look at the vegas strip isn't that that's a beautiful picture that's amazing it's like zoom in on the freaking cars please just show us the cars show us the racing the amount of times they cut to show like this the the paris hotel you know the, the layout of the strip i was like I, I get it we're in vegas i know i'm here show us the cars show us the overtaking attempts show us who is struggling on various corners that is what i want to know and so listening to this was great because that was basically they were just talking about the racing and they barely mentioned vegas <laughs> like at all it was wonderful so that was preferred that was good and also the uh, broadcast that they had on site was delayed this wasn't turn one happens and uh, fernando does a little about face um runs into botas max and charles have their little collision i don't think you need to give me to give you a play-by-play -play for the actual race itself i think you can watch the grand prix i don't think that's why you're here is to hear me just talk about the race itself i will say that being in the crowd for this and seeing charles and uh, p2 and all of that and just hearing the energy from the crowd for when the drivers did different overtakes or logan Sargent came through and things like that that was really cool and that was a really fun experience to be able to scream with everyone and to be able to scream at the mclaren voice to drive faster obviously where lando crashed basically i believe it's been determined that he hit a bump in the road that caused his car to bottom out and for him to lose control of the car scary as shit glad he's okay uh that was a lot of sparks that looked terrifying it was scary in the moment there because it was all of a sudden like oh there's a car in the barrier and you look over and the car looks from the angle they gave us just looked crumpled it was like what the fuck just happened the crowd when charles overtook checo in the last lap was crazy for them yeah. to do that what they wanted to do was back up so <laughs> I don't know. I always get mad at like the video because that's where I want to go to a, a Grand Prix where I have a little more view of the track itself because your guys' camera angles, <laughs> the selection of, of shots you guys get, don't show me what I want to see. <laughs> Overall, the race itself was a fairly good race. Glad Lando's okay. But it was funny because at the end, people were like, yeah, I guess they proved everyone wrong because they gave us a good race. Aside from people saying that the track itself looked ugly, it looks like an upside down pig, the straights, things like that. People were worried about for various cars like the Mercedes and seeing, you know, you guys struggle during, you know, FP1, seeing the safety car, even the footage that they shared for like the first track, uh, the first car on the, the closed circuit to release that safety car footage and show that even the safety car was missing turns at a certain point. People were worried about things like that. But the main complaints for the Vegas GP was not, this is going to be a boring race. The circuit's going to be boring. It was, you guys are focusing too much on the spectacle and not enough on the racing. So the fact that you, this ended up being a good race was a point for them, yes, but that doesn't erase everything else. Let's be realistic here because they made sure that we didn't forget about anything else because they made sure that we were all there for everything else. You get my point? Like they, they, pel they elevated everything else. The racing was just kind of like, a, okay, I guess we're racing now. And then even then it was like, once the, you know, race is done, like stay in your seats, there will not be a storming of the track. And then they kept saying like, oh, and more musical artists and more things and all of this, they're coming to you, all this stuff. And it's like, okay. The complaints were that in the grand scheme of things, the race itself was felt to be like a commercial break with, you know, the musical acts and everything else, you know, to be the the focus of things. So that was the major complaints. No one knew what type of race this was going to be. I was worried for a variety of reasons. And frankly, I don't think I was wrong to be worried because we had various other issues on the track, including, you know, what happened with Carlos and then what happened with Lando. And then it was like, oh yeah, stick around. There's gonna be more musical artists. And then there like, wasn't, there was like a DJ or something again, uh, which it's like, okay, we left. They And they started escorting out of Saudi anyway. So I like, I don't know if there was just a miscommunication with the announcers or something, but they made it sound like there was gonna be like several musical artists. and. There just weren't would i go to another vegas grand prix yes because i love the sport and also because i would be very interested to see how they uh you know course correct because i think what i really wanted someone to ask max which as far as i can tell no one did before now he loves vegas because he won of course he did which is hilarious i wish that someone would have asked him in your opinion how do you think vegas can tweak this in the future 
for future races for fans and for the drivers to be more comfortable driving here to be less frustrated and annoyed what would you like to see change in the future years because i think what vegas needs to really focus on now is one how long it takes them to take down you know the temporary track bits on the street circuit and all of that the where the paddock building and all of that is that's part of the current uh lot that lot is now owned by f1 that's a year-round location that's the year-round track section apparently they have plans to use it for other things or at least vegas does I'd be fascinated to see what that might be um the only thing i can think of is events like ces uh because those are all over vegas uh for uh, CES, the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. I'm assuming that maybe you could like rent out the different rooms. The, that's a massive paddock space and all of that. But everything else they're going to take down. So they've already started taking down a lot of the temporary track here on the Strip. I'd be interested to see how long it takes them to take everything down entirely. And I hope that they learned so much from the setup process of this. Obviously, first year is getting started, all of that. Which we can still complain about while acknowledging that it's the first year and there's growing pains. You know, there, two things can be true at the same time. Because I really think that for the future of F1 in Las Vegas, they really need to focus on not upending the lives of the locals as much as they have currently. I don't like the comments that I've been seeing from F1 fans that aren't in Vegas about Vegas locals complaining. I don't know, how do I teach someone to have empathy for other humans when they clearly don't have any? When people are losing their jobs because they can't get to work on time because the construction is adding an extra two hours to their commute when they weren't planning on that, that's a problem. People having to, you know, plan extra time to get to work and then they're not being compensated for that extra time spent in the car they're not being compensated for that time that gas money they're not being compensated for that because that's the thing it's like there are people there are condos on the strip there are places where people live down here but for the most part vegas locals don't live here they work here and that's for the most part what's being upended and that's something that should not be ignored or just looked down on it's like well you live in vegas and people live in Paris and LA and Anaheim where Disneyland is. People live around Disneyland. I hope for the future you guys start setting up earlier in the calendar year and that uh, you guys streamline it a lot more and try and make it so that the this is not so upending for the locals. Because I think what might happen if this continues to be a burden, because I, I talked about this in my other video as well, where about this being a trickle up and not a trickle down as far as the local economy goes for F1 being here. I worry about the possibility of when the three year, you know, out clause is coming up. Uh, it's not so much that Vegas itself, the, you know, F1 Vegas or what have you is like, okay, this is actually isn't a net, a net positive for us. We should stop this now. Employees, hospitality employees, locals, what have you, start striking and protesting to be demanded to take off the calendar because you haven't remedied how this affects them every single year. I think that that's something to really think about in the long term because we have a 10 year contract in place. And I think that that's something that should not, I don't know why, I don't get why there's so much hostility. The locals are simply saying, this sucks for us. These people are being awful about it. Like, why can't we talk about this? Why can't we have these conversations and try and fix how the locals are feeling about things? I just don't understand why that's seemingly an insane statement for fans to hear. They were never gonna make their money back in one year. And they shouldn't have tried. They should have made this event, in my opinion, honestly, as accessible as possible. Local fans, traveling fans, all of that. And I don't think that they did that. And I think that that was just kind of starting them from behind to begin with. So I hope in the future they really make strides. They've learned from this and learned what like what needs to be adjusted as far as like the setup goes and the planning goes and all of that uh, to try and make this as less disruptive as possible. I get it, it's Formula One, the cars are loud. There's always gonna be some form of disruption, but it's the, the lead up for months that needs to be addressed more than anything else. That's what will really, for me, for next year, really kind of be an indicator for me is like, how much did they actually learn from this year? That's really it. Will I go to another Grand Prix? Absolutely. <laughs> I have plans for next year. A few of you guys want me to review um, the some of the international ones, so we'll see, which I do think I'm going to go regardless. Whether I do a video on it or not, I will be going. Glad this is done. Glad I got to see, uh, you know, Charles get second. I'm glad I got to see some good over, there was a good amount of overtaking on this track, which I do think, you know, was good. I was worried, I'll, I'll fully admit, I was way more worried about this track. I was think I was right to be worried because obviously, 
You know, not what I thought was going to fail, failed. I was worried about the road, but not in the way that I think that I should have been worried about the road. I was worried about, you know, the temporary track bits and things like that, which ended up just being the cement blockades, the same thing that they were using, which is good. I don't know. Some of those, some of those wall clippings that some people did stressed me out too. So I don't know. I'm just an anxious person. And so I've probably chosen the wrong sport to be obsessed with. That's going to be it. Uh, did you watch the Vegas Grand Prix? Were you at the Vegas Grand Prix? Remember, I have a podcast, the Swash Dance Podcast. Remember, Swall Entertainment is now available on Spotify. Remember, I'm now streaming on Twitch. There will be a merch design for this one. Um, probably. I kind of like Spectacle Sandwich. <laughs> Shout out to my patrons. Thank you so much for supporting my Patreon. If you did all six for my Patreon, that was down below. Like to follow me on social media. That'll be all up here. And that's going to have all the day. Goodbye. Honestly, that first night with Aston Martin was so much fun and such a cool experience that it was like very hard to top that the entire rest of the weekend. So... You, Abby, Adira, Amy, Andrew, Angel, Aslan, Cameron, Corey, Donnie, Elliot, Glenn, Goth, Jasmine, Kenny, Lauren, Literal, Madeline, May West, Medic, Micah, Michael, Nathan, Palace, Pink, Cordy, Rachel, Randy, Robert, Rosie, Ryan, Sam, Skylar, Tasha, Tenzin, Thomas, Heavenly, Victor, Winter, Zwink.